So thank you for everybody the coming to the privacy talk. I'm so glad you invited the uh, learn uh, from uh, Europe this moment. It's a uh, very honor to talk about the data privacy, the data protection topics with him. So thank you for coming this moment to interview the man. Thank you for having me. Now, first of all, uh, I'd like to introduce his profile. Uh, he specialized in technology and law. He worked from 2002 to 2011 in various Brussels law firms. Between 2007 and 2011, he was also a researcher at the Research Center in Law and Society at the University of Namur. In 2011, he joined the Belgian DPA as a legal advisor. He worked for within the policy and consultation unit of the EDPS as of 2015, and then for the secretariat of the EDPB in May 2018. In April 2012, the man joined the non obvious business, NOIF, and MGO conducting strategic litigation to enforce digital rights where he stayed until end July 2023. The man is also the member of the litigation chamber of the Belgian DPA, the organ enforcing the GDPR in Belgium. So thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. So let's uh, move on to the today's agenda. So I'm I'm so excited to have a talking like this with you, uh, since the, you are a very brilliant expert in the field of the data protection. So could you tell us uh, wh why did you start your first career as a lawyer, and why did you choose to work in the data protection domain? Um, interesting. I I I think I decided to become a lawyer when I was 12. I must have seen some, I guess, legal movie with the courtroom and everything. I don't know. And I always remember that I, I liked the, I liked, the, I wanted to be this guy in front of the judge, you know, redressing and looking for justice and, you know, defending people and oppressed. And I think it was nice. So I decided to become a lawyer and it happened that it had to go to law school to become a lawyer. So <laughs> it was quite easy. And during my studies, I discovered IT law because it was really the beginning of uh, technology law, telecommunication in e-commerce. And I really liked it. Um, I decided to do a master in IT law after my studies in the research uh, center when I just studied as well in Namur. And it's a specialized master where we did IT, privacy, e-commerce, contract law, competition, and so on. Uh, and then I'm, I guess I had both of, I had, let's say the best of both worlds. Uh, I, I became a lawyer in a law firm, but it was like a business law firm doing e-commerce and uh, IT law outsourcing and IP which was not a lot of litigation, I must say. And it was a lot of advice about how would you comply with the law, but not a lot of litigation, even in e-commerce and outsourcing. Uh, and I continue with various law firm um, until the point where I had to give a lot of advice about monitoring of employees versus privacy law and data protection law. And it was really a huge boom and a huge demand from the clients because they really wanted to know under which condition they could collect the evidence of the employees um, in compliance with the privacy and data protection law. So I had a lot of consultancies to do for clients in this law firm. And that's where I did, a, I mean, more and more privacy and data protection law. I really did a lot. Uh, but even back then, there was the only, let's say, interesting consultation to do because there was really a sanction for the employer, for the employers, really, meaning you you cannot collect and use evidence which is illegally collected as a principle because it's not always true, and therefore there was something really concrete and you know something enforceable for the clients. 
But beside that, any other advice or consultancy that we were preparing for clients in terms of data protection law, uh, they usually ask, what is the risk for me? And back then, before GDPR, I was really, you know, talking about a time before GDPR, in Belgium, the, the risk was super low. So you were just writing and, and you know, researching opinion for your client with a really low risk because the DPA did not have the power to sanction or to enforce the GPR. There was no civil society like no, you know, uh, suing companies for violation of the data protection rights. So basically there was really nice paper, nice documentation that you share with your clients, but it was nothing concrete. Uh, you know, I hope it makes sense. Uh, and at the same time, uh, back then, I think it was in 2011, the Belgian DPA organized a competition um, to recruit new legal advisors. And I was like, okay, let's try to, let's give it a try. Let's see what, what is it on the other side, let's say. And then I joined the Belgian DPA. And then, of course, since then, I'm mainly, and in a, if not only, doing data protection law. And I really enjoyed it. I really didn't know that uh, working for the government, uh, which is not a governmental body, as you know, it's independent, but would be so appealing. But since then, I was doing only data protection law, and I saw the other side of how to enforce data protection law. And since then, I'm I'm really more interested about enforcement and and not litigation, but like concrete application of the data protection law. And I think it's very important because we've been talking a lot, and it's explain also in my former life in my the first years of my career that I'm I did a lot of research and documentation but no I want to enforce it I want to have concrete enforcement example and or maybe non-enforcement but we, sh we should all have clarity not only the consumers but also the DPAs and the controllers the companies we need some clarity we need some enforcement or not enforcement we need fair competition on the market we we need Enforcement on all actors are, are not only two or three. We need something clear, you know. Um, so I hope he answers your question. It's, it's maybe a little bit too long, but that's um, how I came to data protection enforcement from IT lawyer in 20 years. Yeah, thank you. That's a very interesting story for me as well. So you have a very great careers at the data protection space. Uh, and uh, also that you involved of the some of the important work in this space. Uh, one one of them is the in the naive. Uh, I know that's the uh, very important role uh, in the European data protection space. So could you tell us uh, you are about the work at the naive and what did you work there? Um, yes, sure, and I think it's really. The continuation of what I just explained, I, I wanted to enforce the GDPR and I joined the DPA in Belgium back then before the GDPR. So back then it was no really real sanction by the DPA. Therefore, I joined the EDPS because um, back then there was a possibility to, to go to a EU institution if you were working for the Belgian government. And back and at this time, the GDPR was negotiated. So I was taking part in the negotiations of the GDPR for the Belgian DPA, for the DPA, so we were directly involved in the GDPR, so we had all the, the versions of the GDPR in front of our view, of our eyes. Uh, and then I joined the EDPB for the same reason, because I thought that back then the EDPB would be enforcing the GDPR. Maybe I was not really patient, because back then the EDPB secretariat was not really enforcing anything. We had to prepare everything before it was fully functional. And so it was basically doing more admin HR, uh, you know, exchanging emails and not really work on the substance because we had to prepare the rules of procedures, like all this, you know, legal um, work before the EDPB was fully functional. And, um, and still we didn't see anything, you know, concrete in terms of GDPR compliance, you know, and... It happened that Max James, just uh, so the founder of Neub, uh contacted me by email because I met him, um, I think I met him one year before and asked me whether I would be interested to join. And I thought it was maybe time to do something from another perspective with another hat. And since enforcement was not really working yet at the, uh, you know, regulatory level with the regulators, 
I thought that maybe civil society would be a little bit more uh, active in enforcement. And that's why they decided to join uh, NOIP in um, 2020. Uh, and for those who do not know NOIB, NOIB is an NGO, non-governmental organization, uh, funded five years ago by Max Schrems. Max Schrems is a privacy lawyer and activist based in, in, in Austria. And after two major cases that he won in the Court of Justice, he funded NOIB, which stands for None of Your Business. And none of your business is a consumer organization as well, digital right organization, enforcing digital right with a really particular focus on the GDPR. And basically, Noib is filing a lot of complaints against controller um, who are not enforcing the GDPR, but also um, starting legal uh, court suits against organization to enforce the GDPR. So I think you see that. It was interesting to be a lawyer on, you know, giving advice to the clients to work for a DPA, enforcing the GDPR. And here there's a third hat when you can also join the efforts to enforce the GDPR, and that's the civil society at NOI. Uh, and NOIB is really, as we say in our remission statement on our website, filling the gap between theory and, and practice. And really NOIB is there to try to fill this huge gap between a really nice text as the GDPR, but also the lack of enforcement, uh, because DPAs do not have the resources. They, it's difficult for them to agree on the priority and maybe they don't have the expertise. So NOB is really there. It's like a third actor, I would say. And it's not the only one in, 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 in Europe, but I think it's the major one to push the DPAs to, to act and to enforce. So that's what I decided to join NOIB in 2020 um, to help the legal team and, and Max to gear up and to, you know, to speed up and enforce and find complaint, uh, thinking strategic litigation as well, because you have to be strategic when you are enforcing the GDPR in the EU, because you, you have to know where to file a complaint. Uh, in which language, which which data subject, which are the main argument that you should raise, which are the one that you should not. Uh, so it's not only GDPR in the substance, but also how to enforce it and how to litigate. It's really the part that I really missed. Um, so that's the reason why I joined NOI. Thank you. I, I think uh, uh, the the NGO in a data protection space uh, is taking a key. Uh, elementary law to uh, like the protecting of the fundamental rights. Um, so in, in this case, uh, what what kind of uh, the the positions of the NGO to to make a practice? And you this is an example. You support the enforcers to bring this voice to them, or what what kind of the uh responsibilities or load uh praise a load uh in the data protection space but it depends on if it's each civil society organization i would say but a uh, no uh with other ngos is a specific uh it's using a specific article of the gdpr to enforce the gdpr because the text just gives the civil society organization the rights to file a complaint on behalf of citizen. And that's what NOB did. But um, it's, I must say that um, NOB is assisting and supporting uh, people, especially the members, because NOB is based on members. So NOB has members. And usually no abuse you is helping the member to bring their case to know where to go, how to file a complaint, but no is not doing the comp is not always doing complaints for the members because it's only night lawyers uh working at NOB. So it's not enough to help everyone. And second, some some requests from these people, especially the members, are quite interesting. And that's usually give um, birth to a case. So now we decide to take the case and to make a huge, uh, you know, to develop the complaint and the strategy and to apply for funding and to hire a lawyer and to make publicity about the case. Because 
it seems to be an interesting case in terms of clarity, legal certainty, or massive impact. So that's what happens um, in terms of these cases. Yeah, I would say. Thank you. Yeah, it's a very important role to um, protect the civil rights in these positions. So I'd like to move the next question with you about the also the important case of the SHREM 1 and SHREM 2, uh, which is the very important notice, uh, not just only in Europe, but also in other countries as well. So could you share about the story of the SHREM 1 then SHREM 2 and um, what does it happen uh, in the Europe? Yes, sure. So Schrems is basically the, the name of Max Schrems. And it's the, there was someone behind the, the name of the decision of the Court of Justice, and it's basically uh, uh, Max Schrems, we, who was back then uh, still a a student in a law school in Vienna, and he filed a complaint against Facebook in Ireland back then, uh, when he discovered all the data that Facebook was uh, processing about him, because he just made a request to Facebook, and Facebook shared an entire pile of documents about the data that were that was uh, processed by Facebook back then. Um, a complaint and it happened that uh, he considered that uh, with the scandal of the NSA surveillance and uh, Snowden revelation, I, I guess you heard about them, uh, there was a huge problem of access by the, in this case it was the American government to uh, the data of European citizen and decided to litigate the case about this very particular concern, meaning the transfer of data from the EU to the US with, without particular you know, protection. Back then, uh, the the decision was the framework for the transfer of data between the EU and the US was the, the, the safe harbor agreement. Um, and this case went to the, the Irish DPA, then to the Irish court, and then to the court of justice of the EU, who decided to annul the uh, safe harbor agreements. Uh, and that was the Schrems 1 decision. The Schrems 1 decision was back to the Irish court in Ireland, uh, and I think all that happened in 2011. So you can see it's um, it was a long story, a long journey to get there. Uh, back to the Irish uh, court, the DPC uh, wanted to add, take action or didn't want to take action. Uh, and in the meantime, the new um, Privacy Shield Agreement was voted and accepted, which was the second framework for the exchange of data between the EU and the US. The case went back to the Irish court and again to the Court of Justice, and which gave the you know the, the, the last decision, Schrems II, when the Court of Justice again annulled the agreement, so the annulled the Privacy Shield after having annulled the first decision, um, the, the safe harbor, for the same reason, basically, the mass surveillance, the mass collection and interception of data by the US government of uh, data coming from the EU and the lack of judicial remedy from the EU citizen, where the data were accessed by the US government in the US, because the US citizen didn't have the same right as the American citizen. So that's always the same reason why the ECG annulled the two agreement, uh, and it was framed too. Then the Court of Justice, uh, after this Court of Justice decision, the Schrems II, the case was heard by the Irish court again, and by the DPC in Ireland. And finally, and I guess you've seen it, in May of this year, the DPC issued a fine against a meta of 1.2 billion euros for illegal transfer of data from the EU to the US without appropriate uh, legal basis. So basically, and and for I, I would just pass all the technicalities and the, the details of this case, which is a case that Noib also was supporting. Uh, but you can see it's um, it took like thirteen years to enforce and to issue a decision on a complaint which was filed thirteen years ago. So it's really a long, long, long 
uh, journey to enforce digital rights when it comes to these kind of cases. And I think it's really concerning as well, especially when you work at NOI or even at a DPEA, you can see it's really, really long. Um, and it's not always really satisfying, I would say, for all the actors, uh, of course, for controllers, because if you are under investigation for six years, you would like to know what you have to do, but also for civil society, because it just takes a lot of resources to enforce a right. And especially when you see that it's, we are, we, we I would say we work, because I'm not working at NOM anymore, but when you are a GDPR professional and it just takes so long and, and, and just requires so many resources to enforce your right, I'm concerned about how can um, you know a regular citizen uh, enforce its right without being a professional? It's really concerning. So yes, the Schrems 1 and Schrems 2 story or saga, uh, whatever you call it, is also giving a large, um, is really giving a good view on how it's maybe sometimes difficult to enforce your right in the EU. But at least this case is not over. Maybe not, because as you know, there is a new framework that has been uh, voted by the Commission and by the EU, which is the Data Protection Framework. And of course, this framework will also be challenged. Maybe it's not going to be a Schrem 3, it's maybe a Neubwein, uh, I don't know. But the, yeah, we'll see what's going to be the angle to challenge this decision, because we have seen that going in Ireland was not really the most efficient way. So this time, it may be that this um, will be challenged directly before the court. I yeah. hope I made myself clear, because it's really difficult to explain this, this case. Yeah, thank you for sharing the very significant history uh, that the EU involved uh, other civil organization has committed uh, very important actions um, in the data protection space. Um, so in the next topic about the privacy rated, uh, in the last year, uh, EDPS has organized uh, uh, conference uh, in Brussels, and you uh, spoke as a panel on the sessions about the data protection and the important requirements uh, for the mechanism. Uh, so could, could you share about uh, your ideas? So what does it require uh, for the judicial remedies for data protection uh, in your sense? Uh, yeah, I remember this panel. It was really a nice initiative from the EDPS to discuss about the real enforcement of digital rights and especially the GDPR, because as I said, it's not really easy to enforce it. And um, going before a DPA and data protection authority is one way for sure, uh, but it's also sometimes not really easy. And I myself working for the Belgian DPA as a, a member of the chamber enforcing the GDPR, so I know also, it is not really easy to enforce it when you are working in the DPA because there are so many cases and the resources are not lim are not unlimited, right? So it's quite difficult. And an alternative is to go to court, of course. But as you know, court is usually expensive. You need some. You usually need a lawyer to go to court. Uh, so that's not really the way that you would just encourage when you want to advise the citizen, you know, to enforce their right to go to court directly. But maybe it's sometimes a way that can be envisaged, for sure. Knowing that the GDPR recognized the right to have an effective remedy in front of a court as well. Um, this effective remedy may be against the decision of the DPA or lack of decision, and it's another problem, of course. Or you can go directly against a company or an organization processing your data if you think that your data protection uh, rights has been violated. Um, so the first option to go ag against the DPA is something that Noi, for example, was doing a lot, but even other citizens that I've seen, where they are not happy about the decision of a DPA, they usually appeal the decision. And that happened, for example, very recently in the case in the Court of Justice, when uh, the Court of Justice uh, decided that the DPA just uh, gave a wrong interpretation of, um, of the GDPR. So you see that a lot, but it was also another way to challenge the DPA when they do not uh, adopt the decision. And that happens a lot as well. 
Uh, and working for Noib, I can tell you that uh, complaints that were filed four years ago are still waiting to have an investigation open, for example. So we understand this is really a long time. And here as well, you have an effective remedy against its DPA. But this is really difficult to enforce because the national law is usually not providing any deadline for the DPAs to issue a decision. So we usually had to litigate in front of the court to to try to settle a precedent or like a case law saying that, for example, two years was too long for a DPA to not issue a decision. So, you know, that that's uh, effective remedy does not mean anything if there is, you know, no definition in the GDPR. So it is really tiring as well to go to court in every national court to litigate about what does it mean, for example, to handle a case. Uh, the GDPR obliged the DPA to handle UKs, but handling is not deciding, according to some DPAs. So some DPAs just say that, you know, we opened the, the case, we think that it was not really important, and then we closed it. And they consider that they handled the case, which is not, of course, satisfactory for the citizen. So in these uh, circumstances, you can decide to challenge the DPA because they did not act. So I hope I make myself clear. Either you challenge the decision if you're not happy or either you challenge the lack of decision. But that's really difficult because of this lack of definition in the GDPR of what is handling a case, uh, you know, what is an effective remedy, and it's not really clear. What is this obligation of giving you an update every three months about your complaint is not really clear. And the other avenue, of course, is going directly to court not before the DPA against an organization or a company, but of course, that's quite expensive. Um, and it's not always the best avenue. And that's what we did as well at NOIB, just choosing what is the best angle to sue or to file a complaint. Sometimes it's better to go before a DPA because they have investigation power that you don't have in front of a court, because it's free, because we know that this DPA is quite competent to investigate this case. And sometimes we think that it's better to go to a national court because we know the system, because access to justice is quite cheap, and because we know that this court is taking decision quite um, quickly. Voilà. So we have to assess whether it's, go, it's better to go to court or better to go to a DPA. Uh, that's the complexity of having access to a real judicial remedy before the, the court. And we are not there yet, I think. It's really... Is really complicated. Um, thank you for your kind explanations. I assume that the lack of the resources is one of the very challenges uh, to protect the fundamental rights. But uh, you did uh, uh, great work to explore the best options for the European citizens to protect their own rights. So that's the uh, very important actions and this topic and also uh, in in the recent the uh, in the Norway DPA made the decisions about the behavior advertisement uh, against of this uh, news uh, as you mentioned on the shrem 2 parts then uh, it's a very important uh, uh, decisions against of the meta uh, those uh, uh, big companies. So what do you expect from these uh, decisions about the behavior advertisement industry uh, for no way DPA decision? Uh, I don't know what to expect because apparently it already happened. I don't know if you've seen last week that Meta announced to shift to another legal basis for some of the behavioral advertising that they were just organizing on the platform. Uh, I must say that it's quite, uh, it's a nice surprise to see that there was finally an enforcement against uh, the complaint because that's also the Norwegian DPA decision of last uh, month is basically also one of the outcome of a complaint of one of the three first complaint of Noib five years ago. Uh, Three complaints were filed, one in Belgium, one in Germany, one in uh, Austria. All the complaints were sent to the Irish DPC. As you know, the DPC disagreed with the other DPAs and the EDPB adopted the decision. 
the DPC, the Irish DPC had to adopt a decision based on the EDPB decision. This decision uh, was issued in December of 2022 and giving, uh, if I'm not mistaken, three months to Meta to comply with the order. But again, we didn't see anything happening. I didn't see a lot of changes. Uh, and last time I checked it, I think it's changed like recently, even the data protection policy of Meta was not even changed and they all agreed that transparency was not addressed. Apparently, uh, I was not the only one to be surprised not to see anything changing or like not to see any legal basis. You could see that after the decision, uh, Meta decided to change to uh, another legal basis, which was the legitimate interest. Um, and uh, we were, of course, preparing to 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 make an action against that in uh, Noib. But I think the Norwegian DPA seemed to be a little bit impatient as well, uh, since nothing was really moving. Um, and especially uh, considering a very recent opinion, uh, re recent decision of the Court of Justice in the uh, German Competition Authority, when the Court of Justice um, really made clear that behavioral advertising could not be based on legitimate interest in many cases. So, and that's exactly what Meta did in, in, in April, if I'm not mistaken, you know, changing the legal basis. And based on that, meaning the lack of action from Meta and from the Irish DPC to enforce the decision of December or to, to see whether there was compliance from Meta, and based as well on this recent case of just uh, the decision of the Court of Justice confirming that uh, legitimate interest was really not uh, uh, the most relevant legal basis for behavioral advertising. The Norwegian DPA didn't want to wait apparently for the Irish DPC to do something and decided to act and to issue a decision on their territory. It's, it seems that the Norwegian DPA and the Irish DPC has a long history of disagreement uh, that already happened two years ago when it is publicly revealed that they, they publicly disclosed that they did not agree with the uh, Irish DPC. And here you can see that the Norwegian DPA did not want to act or didn't want to wait more and any longer uh, for the DPC to do something. In this case, the GDPR provides the possibility for one DPA to adopt a temporary decision on its own territory. So the Norwegian decision to ban advertising based on behavior by Meta, which is based on legitimate interest, is only valid for three months in Norway. So that's what happened. Uh, it seems as well that it's like uh, an attempt by the Norwegian DPA to bypass the Irish DPC because the Irish DPC was apparently taking too long uh, to the taste of the Norwegian DPA to act. And this case will probably will directly go to the EDPB directly. The EDPB is the organ um, assumed to discuss and decide cases when there is a disagreement between the different DPAs in the member states. So, of course, you can see that here it is going to go directly from the Norwegian DPA to the EDPB without involving the Irish DPA C directly as the lead authority, as we call it. Um, so I think it's really an interesting regulatory development uh, in the EU. But what is also interesting is that the last move of Meta, since Meta announced last week that it will switch to consent, so back to consent, basically, which was exactly what was the complaint uh, by Noib was about five years ago. It's using consent for this advertising, but the consent was not free back then. So Meta just announced that they would just go back to consent for this kind of advertising. So the, as they call it, the highly, um, I don't remember, the highly targeted advertising, I think. And they will ask consent again, which I guess is also a reaction to the decision of the Norwegian DPA. So that's for Meta, of course, because you ask, what about the other industry? And I think it's also important and really crucial here to underline that we cannot accept that with such a decision uh, from the DPB and the Norwegian DPA and the Court of Justice, 
other actors will just remain, you know, unchanged or they will not change the practice. We cannot expect only Meta to be the one compliant. You know, it's nice to always discuss about big platforms or always the, 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 the same ones. But DPS also ensure that uh, it's a fair level, uh, you know, uh, level playing field, meaning that all actors have to follow the same rules. And I would be curious to see whether there would be an action from DPAs against the other platforms using the same kind of advertising and the same legal basis. Uh, so it's very nice to see the result on Meta. Why not? But we have to see whether it, it will be also be implemented by the other platforms in the EU. And on that, I'm quite curious to see what would be the action. Is the civil society going to act against that as well? Or is it the coordinate action from the EDPB uh, going to happen? Or is the Norwegian DPA taking action? We don't know. But that would be very important just not to again, uh, read a decision of the Court of Justice and not do anything about it. Basically, that's what happened with Schrems 1 and Schrems 2. We had two very clear decisions from the Court of Justice and no action after that, which I think is really concerning to see that the highest court of the EU is issuing a decision which is not even followed or implemented by the actors. And here, the Court of Justice uh, uh, in the uh, German Competition Authority, which was issued in June, was finally followed by one DPA, the Norwegian, who didn't want to act for the other DPAs to do something. So I think it's quite news. You can see a huge change. Now that we have a court of justice decision, some DPA are ready to act finally. And, and you know, implementing what the court of justice said and not having cold feet. So we're finally getting there, but it just took years and years to finally understand that yes, when there is clarity, when there is a decision of the Court of Justice, when you have a case already pending for years, it's time to act and to do something. Um, and the last thing, maybe you heard it, but of course, Meta also appealed the decision of the Norwegian DPA in front of the Court of Appeal in Norway. So of course, we will see whether, and they also appeal the EDPB decision, and they also appeal the Irish DPC decision. So there was a lot of appeal pending, but it's part of the game, of course. It's uh, But I hope that we will finally have certainty about what is the legal basis and uh, the legal question issued by, uh, you know, raised by this decision. But I think we already have an answer from the Court of Justice in this German competition uh, authority decision in June that you know, for behavioral advertising as a principle, consent should be obtained and sometimes legitimate interest. We already have an answer on that. Uh, but still, there was a lot of legal questions that still seems to, to be solved by the Court of Justice. So it's, you know, it's a cat and mouse play. Huh? It's really, it's, it's going to take a long time, especially with the appeals pending. But I am really looking forward to have these um, cases ending at the Court of Justice to have clarity about what is happening uh, with these cases. It's really important to have clarity. I hope it's clear what I'm trying to. Yeah, thank you for it sharing. Sense. Uh, it's uh, so insightful then. From the agent perspective, there is a very complicated, but the I think it's in a progression of the uh, these behavior advertisement actions. So we, we just started to discuss this kind of the topic. Uh, I think uh, like the European moves has been a very great uh, reference for the other countries uh, to round about the, what kind of discussion should be the requirements under the uh, industrial uh, issues against of the data protections. So uh, the, the next topic about uh, your future landscape, uh, I think uh, you have been uh, working in the data protection field uh, as a lead in the in industry. So could you share about your planning uh, to do the next, or you have uh, any ideas that you want to uh, do something in the futures? So this is a very important, interesting topics uh, from your a uh, personal idea. You mean from my personal perspective? Yeah, yeah. Of like what... 
also my next moves are not really clear yet so i'm exploring options for my next moves i will definitely stay with the belgian dpa for another two years to enforce the gdpr but it's not full-time position so it just gives me time to think about something else i i have some options uh of a career plan but the first thing that i want to do is just to rest for sure because it's been really uh intense years uh here at noi it was really intense so i need to rest a bit I was thinking to go back to practice to, you know, to practice as a lawyer again, because I really love the enforcement and the litigation part as well. I I really think I would be involved in the collective redress movement. There was a new directive allowing the civil society to enforce digital rights. And I think it's gonna be a huge, 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 uh, game changer in the future uh it's not a, it's not going to be only complaint and legal lawsuit but also huge class action uh in the eu so it's interesting and another thing that i think would be interesting is just to to also work as a data protection uh, council in-house i would love to see how in-house process are just designed how is the discussion going on uh, to understand how the industry and the organizations are preparing themselves for compliance. Um, I don't believe that um, there are two sides of data protection, like the bad companies and the good civil society. I think it's too simplistic. So I really have an interest to have a hands-on approach to see what is happening in the industry, what is organization. And again, being working for the Belgian DPA, you cannot just ignore the difficulties and the obstacles of companies implementing data protection. You know, compliance is not black or white. And I really think it's really interesting and important to understand uh, the struggle to comply by companies as well. So yeah, the future landscape, I'm not sure yet. There was also the option to go back to regulator. I also have a huge interest in the DMA and the DSA because that's, part of the same piece of legislation. And of course, the Digital Governments Act, the AI Act, definitely. And I really think that DMA, DSC, and GDPR is a nice piece of legislation altogether, and it should not be isolated. So I really think that that's something that I would love to do in the future. And also exploring some options right now to see how it can be put together. But I would love to be in a place when I could just you know, articulate all this legislation in practice, that's the most important for me. In practice, not in like papers and discussion, and to have interaction and to make it workable. To you know what I mean. This, the policy side of it is not really my cup of tea. I would love to see what is working, what is not working. How do you enforce it? How do you not enforce it? Uh, what does it mean in the uh, on the field? You know, and is it possible to implement it or not? and to do regulatory and enforcement again. Yeah, it's really to be defending a position, you know, and to test it in court. Uh, yeah, I'm not afraid to test it in court. I really love it. And you can, it's nice to agree to disagree. If you go to a court, it's okay. You have two opinions and that's what the courts are here for. They, they will just take a decision, you know. I really love this part of the job, to have a really clear position. And you go to court and you defend your part of you. Uh, well, that would be my, I, ho I hope it's a little bit clear, uh, that that would be my future plans, which are not really, um, which is still a little bit vague right now. Yeah, that's a great question and very important to uh, keep this mind. I'm also the inspired that's the your conversation that's been uh, important actions for the data privacy expert community as well, indeed. Uh, so at the last, uh, I'd like to ask you about the message for the listeners. So you had uh, many experience in data protection space, and also you shared us the, some of the visions uh, from your perspective. So could you share any message for the listeners? Um, a message, yeah. I'm not sure I will have a message, but... Um... I think dialogue is very important. When I say dialogue is not going to conferences and um, and to have like this fake dialogue, like exchanging papers on a subject and not reading it is not really interesting because I saw it a lot. 
But I think what is really interesting and really important, and especially with AI, and I see it especially from the industry, always defending innovation, you know, uh, how is it possible for the EU market to stay re- competitive if we don't allow this kind of product and something? We should really have a discussion, not only with the regulator, and I really have also a problem with the sandboxes, you know, all this, the safe space when the industry can also discuss with the regulator. I think it's not always the appropriate place to have a transparent discussion. The discussion should take place in the European Parliament or like a national parliament. But I think in the future, we should have a dialogue when all the actors, including the civil society, could understand the problem, to address the problem, and to have concrete example of what is the problem and concrete solutions. You know what I mean? That does not mean that these actors who do not have the power to change the law should change the law, right? So the law is maybe bad, but it's not. It's too late and it's not the right place to change it. It should go be back to the European Parliament, who should maybe sometimes do a better job, I think, because this law is not always very clear. And these new laws are not always very clear. We have to accept it. But the dialogue is important to not only say, oh, we have a problem, for example, of transfer. I would love to see what is your problem of transfer? What is the, 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 you know, the specific obstacle that you have? What is a specific solution you can find? And, you know, instead of just, you know, throwing like buzzword and like, you know, like problems that we don't really understand. Uh, we should really address them in particular and making being very transparent about the problem that we want to address and having a clear discussion or like a case study uh, with the industry, civil society, regulators and the parliament and the commission and, and to understand what is the problem. Because we should not also forget that these legislations are going to be very difficult to implement. Um, I think the legislator is not always aware of the interaction between all these pieces of legislation, meaning the DMA, the DSA, the AI Act, the GDPR. And besides giving a lot of work for lawyers and law firm, he should also give some clarity for the actors, not only for the citizen, but the company and the regulators. And I think the clarity is still not there yet. And that's what I would love to be part of it because I would love to be in, you know, in 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 the crossroad of this discussion to try to identify the problems, try to see what the solution may be, and agree to disagree again, and then to find a solution. And if it's needed, to find a solution before the um, find a solution and just go through legislation and not only regulatory option, because the regulator is not there to change the law. It's only there to apply it and enforce it. And if the law is bad, it's not the fault of the regulator, it's the fault of the legislator. And I think we have a tendency to forget it. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Again, I hope that I made myself clear. (laughs) It was not really a message, but just a hope that in the future we may have better legislation, actually, is really my hope. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, very important for us. Uh, I think uh, regulation is the part of the very difficult for the general citizens, but uh, your work is very important to uh, bridge the, uh, not just like the eye on the policy, but also the practice. Practice is a very important and also that you have many experiences and try to create empower the people uh, in the data protection space. So again, uh, thank you for joining the main this moment. It's a uh, pleasure to have a great conversation with you. Uh, let's keep like an updates and share your new work. Like Thank you so much. <laughs>